The Mouse House, an original short story by Miss Worm. The story I shall tell you today is a personal one, for it involves a tale about my own home. As you may know, I live in England, down in a sleepy corner of Sussex, in a half-forgotten village. You'll forgive me, I trust, if I don't mention it by name. There are, after all, some rather odd people about. Not that I'm looking at anyone in particular. My home, Corkscrew Cottage, is some two miles distant from the village. Not far, you might think, in these modern times. But we do not embrace the modern here. Not in this part of the world. We still have a taste for things that more sophisticated people have long since abandoned. The name Corkscrew is recent, just a few hundred years, but the cottage is much older. It was certainly here when the first Queen Elizabeth was on the throne, and there is mention of a dwelling on this spot in the Doomsday Book of 1085, which, even by Sussex standards, is rather a while. Long enough, at any rate, to have witnessed plenty of strange events. Back in the 19th century, an elderly lady known as Aunt Edith lived here. It was said that her betrothed perished on the battlefield of Waterloo, and her father had fought for the wrong side in America during that unfortunate spat over the price of tea. I shall leave it to your good judgment as to which side was the wrong side. With the coming of the railway, Aunt Edith found herself subjected to visits from a varied assortment of relatives, and one frost-bound snowy winter, her nephew Peter brought along a friend, and it is here that my tale really begins. The midwinter weather had grown unexpectedly fierce, as it often does in these parts, with the snow descending on the heath with such rapidity that it felt like a magician's trick as if we had been convinced to look away whilst some sleight of hand magicked the country white. The track to the village had already disappeared beneath a thick wintry mantle, and it was therefore decided that Aunt Edith's guests should spend the night. Ah, the plot, as well as the snow, has thickened. Corkscrew Cottage is blessed with many rooms, and as you might imagine from its name, it has somewhat of a higgledy-piggledy layout. There are many twists and turns amongst its tiny passageways, with walls that were once on the outside, now on the inside, and what used to be the back door, now in the middle of the parlour. One particularly interesting room is found at the end of the cottage, just far enough away from the main part of the house to feel disconnected. This room is called the Mouse House. Now, the Mouse House is not, as you may have been supposing, overrun with vermin. Aunt Edith would never have allowed such a state of affairs. But it is so called because of its decoration. The oak beams have been carved with many mice over the centuries, and each new guardian of the cottage has added a mouse or two of their own. The telling of the tale informs us that Peter's friend, Richard, I believe his name was, was singularly unmoved by the bucolic charm of Corkscrew Cottage, and less than complimentary about Sussex in general. It is said, if you can imagine such a thing, that he preferred the so-called attractions of London. Of course, that may just be dramatic licence. Richard's complaints were long and dull. The Sussex snow was too cold, the Sussex wind too biting, and Sussex animals too riddled with fleas. In fact, he saw fit to declare himself a hater of all things small and furry. One can only imagine the impression this left on his hostess, for Aunt Edith, being a sensible woman, put more stock in the company of animals than she did people. 
Her favourite faithful companion was a magnificent black cat who had wandered in from the road one cold night some ten years or so before. She named him, with that delicious sense of humour that old ladies often possess, Matthew Hopkins, Witchfinder General. The time came to retire for the night, and Richard took up his candle, making his reluctant way through the darkened hallway to his room. The feeble light fluttered in the draught, and its dancing beams seemed to make the mice move. Oof! Our cosmopolitan city dweller shuddered and undressed hurriedly. He hoped that there were plenty of traps to kill the little beasts. The next morning at breakfast, Aunt Edith remarked upon his pale countenance. Alas, I did not sleep well, he finally admitted, and he grimaced as he plucked a singular cat hair from his trousers. I was plagued by monstrous dreams, the result, no doubt, of too much cheese before bed. What did you dream of? asked Peter, but the more he pressed his friend, the less he said. Suffice it to say, replied Richard, I feel like I have been running to and fro all night. I expect it was the sound of the wind in the attic, suggested Aunt Edith, though the night had been as still as a contented cat. Or perhaps the snow falling from the thatch disturbed you. Yes, yes, of course. But he remained troubled throughout the day and kept a close eye on the weather, keen as he was. To return to the city. Alas for Richard, the elements conspired against him, with snowflakes the size of an old cartwheel penny that covered everything in a silent velvet blanket. That evening they gathered around the fire, and the talk turned, as it often does at Corkscrew Cottage, to the netherworld, to witches and their familiars, and to those things half seen from the corner of your eye. Surely we are too enlightened in these modern times to believe such things, scoffed Peter, and he looked to his friend to lend support, but Richard stayed unnaturally quiet. Despite Richard's obvious tiredness, he seemed in no hurry for his bed, but eventually he departed, and Aunt Edith and her nephew watched the light from his candle gradually dim as he made his way to the mouse house. No sooner had he gone than Matthew Hopkins returned to the room and leapt onto Peter's lap. Have you noticed, asked the elderly lady, that Matthew does not like our guest? He is usually such a friendly cat. Perhaps he can sense that Richard does not like animals cats in particular. I have even seen him shooting them from his dining room window. Peter, how can you be friends with such a person? Peter sighed and stroked the witchfinder general's head. I'm beginning to wonder that myself, auntie, and I'm sure I saw him aim a kick at poor Kitty here. And such a statement, I'm sure you'll agree, sets Richard ripe for a glorious comeuppance. It was three o'clock when Aunt Edith was awoken by a terrible scream. With shaking fingers she lit her night candle and hastened into the passageway. There she met her nephew. Oh, Peter, she cried. It came from the mouse house. Do you suppose your friend has suffered some sort of night terror? They stood for a moment and listened, unwilling to search for the source of that ghastly cry but Corkscrew Cottage was silent, save for the tick of the long case clock in the hall. The floorboards creaked beneath their hesitant feet, and each door shrieked its unwillingness to open. So it was with some reluctance that they edged their way through the darkness, with nothing but their shadows for company. Richard, are you ill? The door to the mouse house refused to budge as Peter rattled the handle. It took all his strength to break open the door, for it had been locked securely from the inside. 
The bed was in frenzied disarray. The white snow-like sheets were scrunched into a chaotic muddle and they hung like icicles from the empty bed. The blankets had been kicked away and Richard's clothes lay in shredded tatters on the floor. But of Richard himself, there was no sign. Where can he be? Peter ran to the window and flung open the curtains. The snow, almost as high as the sill, was crisp and untouched. Aunt Edith had nailed the window shut against the draughts. There was a sudden movement in the corner, and Peter grabbed the fireside poker, ready to strike whatever was lurking there. But it was only Matthew Hopkins, Witchfinder General. He was watching something closely. His amber eyes glinted in the candlelight, and his great black paw patted at the skirting board. It was just a carved mouse, but it was a mouse that Aunt Edith couldn't remember seeing before.